One of my next door neighbors is a 90 year old man suffering from Alzheimer's. And every single morning at 9 a.m., he knocks on my door and he asks me if I have seen his wife. Which means that every single morning at 9 a.m., I have to explain to a 90 year old man suffering from Alzheimer's that his wife has been dead for quite some time. <laughs> now, I have thought about moving. I have thought about just not answering my door in the morning. But to be honest, it's worth it just to see the smile on his face. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to The Last Laugh. I'm Matt Wilstein from The Daily Beast. This week on the show, I talked to one of my absolute favorite stand-up comedians, Anthony Jeselnik. I first saw Anthony on the roast of Donald Trump about eight years ago, and he has just been a dominant presence in the comedy world ever since. Earlier this year, he released what was probably his best stand-up special yet, Fire in the Maternity Ward, on Netflix. Now, he has a new interview series on Comedy Central called Good Talk. Anthony can be a little bit intimidating on stage, but he is incredibly thoughtful about comedy in person, and we had a really great conversation that I think you all will enjoy. So let's get to my talk with Anthony Jeselnik. Are you based out here, or are you in yeah. New York? Yeah, I live out here. For a while you've been out here? I started out here, then I moved to New York for like two or three years, and I've been back for seven or eight. Yeah, so you shot the new show out here? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I want to start there because I really enjoy. I got to watch all all six oh, that's good, so cool. good talks. That's so cool. Um, and it's a really interesting, unique, funny show um, that feels different from other talk shows. Was that kind of the was that kind of the goal to make it uh, different? <laughs> I definitely wanted to be different. I mean, everything that I do, I try to make it a little bit different. But it was fun to just kind of play with the format, just be like, we're going to make something very simple, and then it evolved as we went. And I kind of saw what I enjoyed and what I didn't, what the guests enjoyed and what they didn't, that mm -hmm. uh, without having a pilot and just being able to jump in and talk to six of my friends who had to trust me. Yeah. You know, I had to be like, this is what the show is. And they're like, mm, <laughs> I think you're going to pull something on me. It yeah. uh, was really interesting. Yeah, it does experience. seem like it was kind of an excuse to just roast your friends on TV a, to some degree. A little bit. Like, I can't help <laughs> myself. And we even, like, toned that down a little bit because we were like, we're putting people too much on their heels that let's... Uh, Let's make it a little more heartfelt, and then, you know, I can't mm -hmm. help but get my digs in. Yeah. It does feel like the persona that you have on the show is similar to your onstage persona, but maybe a little different, maybe a little bit more like the the real you. Does it does it feel that way? Absolutely. Uh, you know, Natasha Leggero described the show as it's like comics talking, like, right before they go on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, in the green room. Like there, So you're in that mode of you're about to do stand-up comedy, so you are a little amplified. It's not uh, like a straight-up Charlie Rose where I'm just interviewing someone. It's like, I'm here to have fun mm -hmm. uh, with my friends. Yeah. What, what made you want to do an interview show in the first place? Uh, I don't like making television. <laughs> and I thought, if I'm going to come back, I want to do something that I can enjoy. Mm -hmm. You know, stand-up for me is very much a get-to-do situation where I never feel like I have to do it or I'm being forced to. I, I truly enjoy it. And to do a TV show like that is difficult because there's so many moving parts and it's so collaborative. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how can I eliminate that and just make the most simple thing possible and have fun with my friends? Like, I really am having a good time and I hope the guests are too. Yeah. I mean, this is your second show with Comedy Central, right? After mm -hmm. the Jeselnik Offensive was the first one. You said you wanted to call this one the, the Jeselnik Inquisition. Yes. But they I, didn't let you? No, we really fought. Like, the one <laughs> fight I had with the network on this show was over the title. Mm -hmm. uh, I really didn't want to call it Good Talk. You don't like the title? I think it's just like it's just a little bit too generic for mm -hmm. what I am. Mm -hmm. But anything that was to me, they thought it'll get confused with the Jeselnik Offensive mm -hmm. or... Uh, they thought the Jeselnik Inquisition was too smart. Like people wouldn't know what that was. <laughs> um, and then finally, I remember we were like, we, we were kind of, it was getting a little bit heated mm -hmm. where I was like, I want a title. I want it, I just want that done so we can move on. Mm -hmm. And they kept saying, well, the title has to describe what the show is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're coming up with all these different things and they're like, no, this doesn't work. Or this might make guests afraid to come on the show if it sounds too hardcore. And I said, well, what about your show? We're at dinner. I'm like, what about your show, The Other Two? Mm -hmm. How'd you come up with that title? And he goes, oh, it's a line from the pilot. 
And I'm like, guys, you keep saying it's got to describe the show. That's not describing the show at all. And then <laughs> someone jumped in and was like, what about Good Talk with Anthony Jess? I'm like, and they were like, okay, okay, that's good. Uh, we'll use that. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to complain about it in almost every episode. Yeah. yeah. So it was, a, it was an argument ender more than anything else. Yeah. It was just like, <laughs> let's let's just make peace and move on. Um, so you have you have your, as you said, your, fr- your comedian friends on the show. You have Natasha Leggero, Nick Kroll. Nick, you've been doing comedy for so long. Uh, who are some of your, like, your comedic influences mm. besides the way golfers dress? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, you really wish I didn't have this button. Do you feel the button work, the button up to the top works I'm for the golfer joke? I'm glad you're doing it so I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I know, we wrote this joke well in advance. Yes. Not knowing what you're going to be wearing. But you figured it but would be somewhere in, the, in that vibe. I've never seen you not look like you could be carrying golf clubs. How do you prepare for the interviews? Because these are people that you know. So are you trying to find out new things about them or just trying to kind of illuminate the audience about stuff you already know? Or kind of how do you, how, do you, how did you go about it? It's a little the former. It's like it's, I feel like the, the, the difference between my show and a lot of other shows is that I'm also an expert in what I'm talking about. You know, mm-hmm. I'm an expert in stand-up comedy, but I have my own theories and my own philosophies that I'm interested in how I differ or uh, you know, how I compare to my peers, people I respect. Uh, so I was, I was really interested to find out uh, if people kind of felt the same way I did or, uh, or felt the opposite. Um, so I, I really did ask questions that I wanted to know, mm-hmm. uh, things that I was curious about, and then just, you know, screw around and have fun. Yeah. And it's not just about them. It's also sort of about comedy itself in a lot of ways and sort of what that experience is like so is there anything is there an example of something that you that you found out about somebody or found or made you think about comedy in a different way after having the the conversation no but the opposite happened where i kind of (laughs) changed people's minds uh my i've used this example a couple times but Kristen shaw was on and i would do a thing called agree or disagree and I would just make a statement about comedy that people would make. And I'd be like, do you agree with this or not? And uh, the statement was, uh, all comedy comes from surprise. Mm-hmm. And which is something that George Carlin used to talk about. Like he would say, there is no shock humor. Like a shock is just a surprise. Every punchline is a surprise. Um, and that's clearly what I, what I you know, work in. Mm-hmm. But uh, Kristen Shaw said she disagreed. And I was like, I, I don't, I think you're wrong. Because she, she's like, my, my joke is the commitment to the bit not the surprise. I'm like, well, the surprise is that you've committed to this bit, mm-hmm. you know, that you keep on doing this dance for 10 minutes. That's the surprise. And it keeps on being surprising because you just don't stop. And she emailed me afterwards and was like, I keep, I keep thinking about that. Uh, <laughs> you changed the way that I think about, uh, about my comedy that I thought was, uh, was really cool. So you changed her mind, but nobody was able to change your mind about, about anything. No, I'm pretty set in my ways and you can't really, like I, maybe uh, all my philosophies aren't universal, but you're not going to, uh, you're not going to blow my mind at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there any part of it that has, that, um, where you were thinking about interviews that you've done or that you've had to do? And I'm thinking specifically about the, the who cares, uh, stamp that that comes up from time to time Mm -hmm. um where you you do a thing where you ask people a question and then as they start to answer you some a voice comes on that says who cares yes a lot of like you'll be doing an interview and then you just can you can feel them slip into your wikipedia page Mm -hmm. you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it's like they just did the bare minimum of research (laughs) and they're going to ask you a question you've been asked a hundred times and there's nothing funny there it's just like why are you asking me this uh, that I thought was fun to lampoon. Like we even did a thing uh, that didn't work. We had to cut out of the show, but it was called How'd You Get That? Mm-hmm. Where we'd ask about a job they had. I'd be like, Kumail, you were in uh, The Big Sick. And then it'd be like, how, before they could answer, it's like, <laughs> how'd you get that? Because comedians- Yeah, you get that a lot. It's a famous thing of like, yeah, like you're on The Tonight Show. And they're like, well, how'd you get that? Like, it's because I worked hard and mm-hmm. I was seen and I went through the motions. It's not like I had lunch with this person and they, they gave it to me, which mm-hmm. is the answer people always expect. So I think comics who have achieved a lot will say, how'd you get that as a joke? Mm-hmm. And younger comics ask it very sincerely. Why did you cut it out? It just didn't work. Like it didn't, people don't know that, you know, the comics yeah. even were a little confused. Um, whereas I think who cares worked because it sounds like a goddamn gunshot uh, <laughs> and people were just stunned. Just takes um, them aback. Yeah, that how'd you get that? People would then answer sincerely how they got it. And I was like, that's not the point. One of my favorite bits in the whole show is uh, is this uh, a Dane Cook's Instagram or a 16-year-old girl's Pinterest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, and I think, remember, the Standards and Practices woman from Comedy Central <laughs> said it's her favorite bit she's ever read. Really? Like People were very <laughs> excited about it. That's always good to hear from Standards and Practices. Yeah, it's, it's something I rarely hear. Is, <laughs> this is my favorite. It's usually like, please don't do this. Yeah. 
so how did how did that come about the the Dane Cook or a sixteen year old's Instagram? Is that just a, an observation you had at some point? It's or? not even my. I mean, it's it's a very well tread observation in mm-hmm. comedy. I mean, Daniel Tosh talks about it constantly about his Instagram page, and you look at it and it is it's bonkers. It's a lot of pictures of him, uh, you know, with his shirt off and like inspirational quotes, and we were just like, let's take these and uh, and make fun of him for it. I don't know if he would even get upset if he saw because it it's like you know what this is. Mm-hmm. You know, it is it is a tough game to play. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what his reaction is, if any, to it on Instagram. Maybe his, he'll. Uh... <laughs> I, I, his, I mean, his Instagram has been has been flayed publicly so many times, and he does not care that uh, I, I, our relationship couldn't be worse. I'll mm-hmm. say that between you and him. Yeah. You have said that you were uh, mistaken for him uh, once, I, I think I read somewhere. I get it occasionally. People would do – there was a time in my career where people didn't know who I was, but they knew I was someone. Mm-hmm. They would come up and be like, are you Dan Cook or are you <laughs> Daniel Tosh? And I was like, no. You obviously know I'm not. My name is Anthony Jesselnick. Mm-hmm. And now that I have this beard, uh, I get it a little bit more. You get it more? Yeah. Oh, really? I would think you get it less. No, because it's like people. He had like the stubble oh, yeah. that uh, that people people like to uh, people like to compare us. <laughs> um, you also have a, a segment on the show called "Make God Laugh," uh, where you uh, pay tribute to uh, comedians who have passed. Um, how did you decide that you wanted to include that? And it kind of, in, on the one hand, it's a more uh, sentimental bit than maybe people are that you're known for, but you but you still make it funny at the same time. So what what was the uh, what was the thought behind that? Uh, I just thought it was a uh, it was a little bit dark, you know, which I always enjoy mm-hmm. talking about someone who's passed away. And it was, I mean, immortality in comedy is interesting to me because it's almost impossible. Uh, jokes don't survive that long and comedians are quickly forgotten uh, once they've passed for the most part. That I, I thought it was fun to, not fun, but just a nice little tribute to, to, for, to someone, for someone to talk about a comedian who's passed. And they don't really play their clips that much, you know, once you're, once you're gone. You don't see a lot of Greg Giraldo uh, repeats specials that, uh, that I thought was a good way to get to get a clip on and someone could give to talk about their experience with someone. And I, I thought it was touching to me that two different comics insisted on talking about Brody Stevens. I thought everyone would just be like, I want to talk about Mitch Hedberg. And mm-hmm. we did not have Mitch Hedberg on. It was, yeah. uh, it was all, uh, it, it was all people who were sincere about who they chose for the most part. You know, sometimes I'd be like, you know, Tig, how about we do Bernie Mac for you? And she mm-hmm. was like, great. Like she didn't, she didn't care. Did she have, um, she didn't have a strong connection to Bernie Mac? Not at all. We made it sound like she yeah, did. For I, I, I caught purposes. that a little bit. I was like, really? Tig is really, she's really influenced by Bernie Mac. Tig, well, Tig, my relationship with Tig is that I could say anything to her and she would say yes. You mm-hmm. know, like she, we just, we have that dry kind of uh, rapport with each other that I thought this will be perfect for her to be like, Bernie Mac was a big influence on you. We were going to do one with Natasha where it was a comic who's still alive <laughs> that we thought it'd be fun to slip in someone who was still alive and it just did not work at all that we had to take it out. Yeah. Who, who was it? Can you say? Uh, Kyle Cease. We mm-hmm. thought he would be the funniest person to say. Uh, and even like, I think Comedy Central Legal was like, you can't say he's dead. Mm-hmm. You have to say something, you know, that makes sure people know he's still alive. And I think <laughs> even then, I'm sure he would have been annoyed. But it just, as a comedic bit, it didn't, it didn't work. Yeah. Uh, so you've had six, you have six episodes coming out uh, in the fall. Um, and do you, is there a hope that you'll make more? And is, are there guests that you that you have thought about that you'd really like to have on the show if you do get to make more? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I definitely, I want to do this show as long as I can. Mm-hmm. I want to, I'd like to get to the point where that I'm talking to people that I like do not know or care <laughs> about. You know, I think that seems fun. Uh, the six people I had were like just a murderer's row. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the people that I couldn't get, it was, it was friends of mine who were like, I'm sorry, I'm doing a movie. Mm-hmm. You know, we only had two weeks to do these six episodes. So people couldn't fit in that next year uh, or next season, I'd love to have, mm-hmm. you know, Ali Wong, John Mulaney, Sarah Silverman, Chris Rock, people that I asked originally mm-hmm. who uh, couldn't do it for whatever reason. Yeah. Hopefully, I, I wonder if when comics see it, uh, whether it will make them want to go on more or less. Uh, so. I think it'll make them want to <laughs> go on more because they understand like every comic treated it differently because there was no pilot to show them. Mm-hmm. You know, they couldn't see what it was. So some people treated it like it was like Mark Maron's WTF. Mm-hmm. And some people treated it like it was just like an improv game that I think when people see it, they'll be a little more prepared and a little less nervous. You know, you see, you, they, they would find out it's just me and them for half an hour. But when you actually see it, you realize how little of it is actually like digging into personal stuff and how much of it is playing, you know, stupid mindless games. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that people will see it and be like, oh, that looks fun. I don't prepare anything. Let me come in and do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we talked a little bit about your your onstage persona, um, you know, on stage compared to on this show, compared to in real life. 
do you ever do you ever feel like you get sick of performing in that persona do you ever wish that you could do be different or do you do you feel like you're you're kind of locked into that uh that persona it's not I mean, locked in is is not a bad term but it's i don't feel confined by it mm-hmm. you know i just kind of go up and as i've as i've been doing stand-up for longer and longer it becomes more natural more part of me where my real life persona bleeds into the stage persona but it is really fun mm-hmm. and you know after taping my last special there's always that thought of like okay do i change it up a little more do how do i evolve and if you consciously try to evolve, I feel like that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. That you end up doing like a 180 just to do something different for the sake of doing something different when it's not organic. That I just find that the more I write, uh, the writing takes me to where I'm going to go. And the persona kind of follows along with it. But it's not a conscious decision to even slide into the persona. It's mm-hmm. just how I am on stage. Yeah, I mean, you do seem very set on on getting better with each um, special, though. I mean, I know that's something you've talked about and... Uh, so how do you how do you think about that if you're not gonna you know mix it up how do you do you do you feel like you need to top yourself with each special? I don't think top is the word, but you need to evolve and then j- the jokes need to be different. And I've put myself in such a small box as a performer and the things that I talk about that the feat is just being able to repeat it, mm-hmm. you know, without being t- too repetitive. Like there's certain bits, like I, after my last special, I can't do another abortion joke. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, t- I took all of that out. Like th- I can't do anything about dropping babies like that. That, uh, <laughs> that has been thoroughly uh, squeezed out that I'm just, I don't know what it's going to be, but I enjoy that process of, of finding it. And mm-hmm. I think that's where, um, you know, brilliance is the wrong word, but to be able to use ingenuity to kind of do the same sort of jokes. This will now be my fifth hour. Uh, I just can't believe I've been able to repeat it at all, Mm -hmm. uh, much less do five of them. Yeah. So fire in the maternity ward came out on Netflix earlier this year. And as you said it, you, uh, you end that special with a long, uh, abortion joke. It's like the last 15 minutes or so of the special after you've been telling a lot of one liners, shorter bits, so how did you, when you were putting the special together, how did you come to the decision, okay, this is going to be the the last you know quarter of the of the hour? I think just the length of it in, uh, in necessitated that it would be a closer of mm-hmm. the special. And I, I actually did take a friend to, uh, to get an abortion. And afterwards, I thought of a joke, just one small joke. Mm-hmm. And I, I asked her permission if I could do it. And she said, yeah, go ahead. Uh, and then I just, every night I was driving to the comedy store, I would think of another thing to add to it. And it became fascinating to me that I was just so excited to get on stage and try out like one new line in the story. And eventually it grew to the 15 minute, 16 minute uh, story that you see in the special. People ask me, what was it like? What was it like to take your friend to get her abortion? It was boring. I don't know why I thought it was going to be fun and exciting. (laughs) But trust me, the only person more disappointed than me that day was the baby. Yeah, I was wondering what your friend, assuming the story is true, uh, you know, thought of the of the finished product on the on the special. Uh, I mean, just happy that uh, that it was funny and felt honored you know, uh, felt honored by it. Um, I had to do it. uh, I remember the first time I had to do it in front of her was a little awkward. It was because it was not, I mean, it was not my baby, Mm -hmm. but it's uh, my friend and her boyfriend come to see the show and I walk off stage and she gives me a big hug and then he (laughs) wants to give me a hug and I'm like, this is really uncomfortable. Like, (laughs) I don't know how I feel about this, but... uh, but yeah, she was, I mean, she was very on board and it's, I think it's a pro choice bit. It's, there's no judgment in it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it, while it is based on a true story, the details are, are completely made up. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's sort of the way it goes is you're constantly saying things or saying, saying things that you wanted to say and maybe wanted to say in the moment, but didn't say, um, and it kind of reminded me of, uh, you know, how Larry David talks about Kerber enthusiasm about how that's it's not really him in real life. These are all the things that he wishes he could say in real life. Is that at all how you think about it? Or is it, is it different? No, it was more just like me daydreaming in this waiting room for Mm -hmm. two and a half hours and thinking like, you know, what a lot of my comedy comes from like, how could I mess this up? You know, what's the worst thing I could say in this situation? And, uh, and that sticks with me, but like uh, sitting in there, like Googling 
what what's a present to get someone after an abortion is true. Like mm-hmm. that I, that website did come up that I'm mm-hmm. sitting there like just for two and a half hours waiting mm-hmm. that uh, that it was just all the different things that could happen there um, just stuck with me. Um, another part of that special is uh, when you talk about getting fan mail from a white supremacist. Is that a, is that based on a real uh, story? Yeah, it happened a long, long time ago. It was after like premium blend. I think I did premium blend, and there was a a uh, joke about being adopted. Mm-hmm. And it was like, uh, my parents told me I'd been adopted. And I was like, why'd you pick me? Was I special? And they said, yes, because of all the babies we had to choose from, you were the only one that was white. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's a joke about adoption. Like people yeah. who like have adopted kids are like, I love that joke. And then racists are like, oh my God. And I'm like, you don't understand. That joke is not for you. <laughs> uh, but I got a fan letter uh, from a guy who was like clearly a white supremacist at Jacksonville, Florida. I remember the name was like the most white supremacist name ever. It was mm-hmm. like something, it's, uh, he sounded like he founded a fraternity kind of thing, <laughs> one of those weird old like Confederate names uh, and wanted me to do a gig and I just I just never wrote back. But it was it was scary because you're like, it was so early on in my career that I was like, oh, is this what my fan base is? Mm-hmm. You know, are they, is it is it white supremacists? You never, you never know. And mm-hmm. what would you do if they actually offered you money in a time when you needed money? You know, I was glad that I, I wasn't faced with that decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, you've talked a little bit about how you've, you've told jokes that you've either rethought or stopped telling based on, you know, the reaction that they got or just thinking about it after the fact. Um, you know, there's the uh, there's the hate crime joke that I know you've you've talked about before um, that you I think you stopped telling after the, the Pittsburgh shooting is that right because mm-hmm. you because you grew up in pittsburgh right yeah i mean it, then that wasn't the only reason it wasn't like mm-hmm. i was like well now this has affected me mm-hmm. now uh now I, I think about it differently it was just one of those jokes that was so short that it got quoted a lot even like after live shows people would remember that one joke mm-hmm. you know my most quoted joke on twitter or when people think like what's the first joke you think of when you think of anthony jessel I'm like isn't always my best one it's usually the shortest one that people can remember mm-hmm. that i thought this i don't even love this joke that much and it's only 10 seconds of the hour that it's easy to lose. I mean, if it had been a five-minute bit, I probably would have kept it in. Mm-hmm. You know, there were certainly bits, like th- there's a racism chunk that was one of the first things that I developed in the hour that I thought if I was developing it now, I probably wouldn't have in there. But I kept it in because I stood by the jokes and I, I thought they were great jokes. Um, but uh, but certain things like, I don't tell rape jokes anymore, but it's like because I told five rape jokes in one special, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, that's done now. Um, and I've... I haven't become more sensitive. I think I've become more educated. Mm-hmm. That uh, as I do that, it's just it's it's like you know, what do I gain from it? Yeah, I mean, has the as the are there other things that you have decided to take out? You know, maybe even after because um, now we're we're talking not too long after this El Paso shooting, which was also um, you know targeted at Latinos. When these events happen, I mean, there's sort of this. Sometimes you make jokes, find a way to make a joke about stuff like that on Twitter. Um, but does it also does it make you kind of go into your act and think about, oh, is there anything that I that I would want to take out? No, I mean, it, I, it, it, it's the opposite. It makes me want to find something, mm-hmm. some way to talk about guns that hasn't been done and that I can then make mine, you know, without being preachy. Uh, but get to it. And I have, I definitely have gun jokes in my act from previous hours, but, uh, and I used to make a joke every time there was a shooting and then you just run out of stuff, man. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> there's so many of them that, uh, I don't know what to say anymore. Yeah. And that was sort of, that was often on Twitter. You would kind of, uh, take a, a news story and you still do that from time to time is, is sort of trying to find a, a comedic angle on, on a particularly dark news story? No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's the only way I really enjoy Twitter now is like I, I, some news story comes up and I can kind of, if I can do it in one sentence, you mm-hmm. know, make a line and you hope you get it in there quick. Sometimes you do a joke on Twitter and then you look and it's been done a hundred times before you got there. And then sometimes you can hit the sweet spot where it's an angle no one has and, uh, and that's always really enjoyable. Do you feel like you were that you were kind of hustling on Twitter more earlier in your career and have kind of slowed down uh, doing it now that you've gained more success? Do you feel like it's not as necessary a part of your uh, brand? I mean, I don't think Twitter <laughs> is necessarily part of anyone's brand anymore. You know, yeah. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Snapchat. I'm mm-hmm. not on Facebook. So Twitter is really the only outlet that I have. So I still use it. But uh, part of my thing was never to be a hustler on it. Mm-hmm. It was like maybe one tweet a day, if that. Mm-hmm. And there was a while where I felt like people would be like, where's your joke? And I was like, oh, I better have a joke. And then I realized that if you don't joke about a tragedy, nothing happens. 
You know, mm. if you have a bad joke about a tragedy, it's it just it's it's multiplied. It's worse. So I stopped kind of I stopped feeling like I had to feed the beast. And if I think of a joke, great. If I don't, I don't tweet. You yeah, know. I mean, we've seen some people, you know, thinking about like Gilbert Gottfried has gotten in trouble for tweeting about tragedies, um, you know, lost sponsorship deals and stuff like that. Do you do you worry about that? I mean, I know you've, you've talked about feeling like you've kind of been grandfathered in in terms of the political correctness thing. Um, but do you do you worry as you gain more fame? Do you worry more about being, you know, quote, canceled no uh never um because i I don't really have things to cancel you know comedy (laughs) central is not going to get upset about a controversial joke Mm -hmm. uh no matter what as long as it's coming from you know a a, a decent place which i think most of my jokes do um i mean i couldn't like use the n-word and have them back me on it Mm -hmm. but i would never do that yeah um uh so i don't have to worry about losing a sponsorship deal and i found that with Twitter, the people get in trouble when they have multiple tweets. If you keep it to one, <laughs> let people argue in the comments and leave it alone. If you mm-hmm. tweet a bunch of different ones, like Gilbert Gottfried had, it was like a tweet storm of jokes about the tsunami mm-hmm. that people, it starts to pile on. Or you start arguing with people and that gets out of control. That if you just do one and walk away, you can't really get into trouble about it. And people who get outraged 24 hours later, they're they're fine. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the this kind of new newish trend of going back through people's tweets and and digging stuff up especially when they get new big jobs like we saw it happen to to trevor noah uh kevin hart with the with the oscars um what do you i mean what's sort of your reaction to to that stuff when it happens i mean it doesn't really affect me so much like people Mm. try to do it to me and i just i just laugh (laughs) at them uh but when i see it it's it's a little i think it's a little boring and they'll try it. It just seems like an easy way to find an angle. You know, Twitter's easily searchable, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is the reason they do it. Like, if one day they can find a way to search podcasts mm-hmm. for things people have said, I think people are in some real trouble <laughs> because of the things people say. I think yeah. no one's ever going to listen to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that people become s- too smart. You know, like when it, there's a controversy in comedy, it can only really happen once because it happens again. People are bored of it already, so it's it's predictable. It's strange that you have to like scrub your Twitter before you like they announce you have a major job, but it's not something that's ever going to affect me uh, in any negative way. Mm-hmm. Unless you get some really big opportunity to host something major or uh, an award uh, show, or I mean, but an award, hosting an award show is not an important job to me. You know mm-hmm. that I would I would probably turn it down before it ever got to the point. And they'd be like, well, "What about this?" And if they mm-hmm. were going to use me, they would know full well. Like, I mean, even after a lot of my controversies, I hosted Last Comic Standing. You know, mm-hmm. which is one of the most mainstream things you can do. So uh, it is possible, and I just think I'm uncancelable. Coming up. Anthony talks about the Weekend Update audition that almost changed his life. This episode of The Last Laugh is brought to you by Euphoric. The entire CBD industry is talking about this innovative patented hemp oil-infused chewing gum. What makes Euphoric so special? Euphoric hemp oil-infused chewing gum is not your average gum. In fact, it's an innovative patented delivery system. What makes this gum so innovative? As a chewing gum, Euphoric brings the innovation to the CBD market in that its patented delivery system is time-released and all the action happens in the mouth. The gum's flavor and consistency make it possible to chew it longer. Chewing the hemp oil-infused gum longer increases absorption in the mouth. In fact, Euphoric hemp oil-infused chewing gum has the best absorption rate on the market, 84%. Compared to edibles like gummies and tinctures, even capsules, Euphoric's absorption rate is about 50% greater. This is because edibles have to pass through the digestive tract, which breaks down the ingredients and drastically reduces their absorption rate. Euphoric, however, keeps the hemp oil-infused gum in the mouth longer, completely bypassing the digestive system. Euphoric is legal in all 50 states, gluten-free, sugar-free, non-GMO, and even supports dental health because it contains xylitol. You only need to try Euphoric once to see what all the fuss is about. To prove it, a limited supply of free trials have just been released nationwide. Just visit this website, lovethisgum.com, to claim your free trial today while supplies last. Again, that website is lovethisgum.com. Lovethisgum.com. I mean, your your style is different from a lot of the other comedians who are who are on Netflix or anywhere else, and that you tell you know shorter jokes. Um, and when you were when you were growing up, were you 
into that type of comedy or what was what were kind of like your the big things that you were into when you were when you first started watching comedy i mean i loved all comedy and anything that seemed a little dangerous i was more into but uh jokes certainly uh rang my bell you know i mean i watched everyone from elaine boozler to bob hope but uh but the, you know guys like um stephen wright uh, Rodney Dangerfield, those guys really like. I was I was just so excited that they were doing what they were doing. That how did you think of it type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack Handy's deep thoughts were the funniest things in the world to me. Mitch Hedberg later on, I just loved jokes so much more than I love stories. I can sit and watch someone for an hour, but I call it like the who gives a shit test. Mm -hmm. Someone who's very funny, they're, they're killing with the crowd, but you get up and you don't remember the name. You don't remember what they were talking about. Uh, you just kind of watched and were entertained. I really enjoyed jokes because you would you would remember that joke. Mm -hmm. um, what do you What do you remember about sort of the first jokes that you started writing? How old were you? What where were you in your life? And and when you when you started seeing whether you could write jokes like that? I mean, putting pen to paper to write a joke, I did not do until I started stand up. Until I was like twenty three, mm -hmm. um, I would. I don't think I even wrote funny. Like I, I was. A, I took a lot of creative creative writing classes in school but it was it was darker stuff than than funny i don't think there was mm -hmm. any real comedy in it yeah um and then once i kind of learned about setup and punchline uh and i, I saw some people at open mics doing one-liners that i didn't realize you were allowed to do that it seemed like this was stephen wright territory mm -hmm. maybe mitch hedberg territory but the average person couldn't even attempt it and then once i realized you could i would literally just take jack handy books and read them and then go write my own jokes and so they were more absurd than uh than dark and i found that even like the best jack handy joke might not do well if you told it as a stand-up joke there were only certain ones the twist had to be good enough and realistic enough that to get people to laugh on stage as opposed to reading it something that was very funny being read wasn't mm -hmm. as funny on stage and then once i i found a dark one uh i realized that that sort of laugh was what i was going for all the time mm -hmm. i just love that i shouldn't be laughing but i am do you remember the first time you you felt that Mm -hmm. I was at an open mic, uh, Jennifer's Coffee, uh, uh, in um, oh, in the valley somewhere. I don't know if it's even still a coffee house, but it was like a Saturday open mic that you would get there at like four in the afternoon, sign up, and then at eight the open mic would go. So mm -hmm. I would go and sign up and then write jokes. And the joke was, uh, my girlfriend loves to eat chocolate. She's always eating chocolate, and she likes to joke she's a chocolate addiction. She'll be like, Anthony, keep me away from those Hershey's bars. I'm addicted to them, and it's really annoying. So one day I put her in the car, and I drove her downtown, and I pointed out a crack addict. And I said, you see that, honey? Why can't you be that skinny? <laughs> and the audience, and this is all comics, people who like don't want to laugh at you mm -hmm. because they're, like, they're in competition, just went, ooh. And I thought, oh, that's it. So everything from there, like someone was dying in the joke or something mm. bad was happening. And it, it turned me into more of a villain than just this like bizarre guy up there who was saying weird, random things. Mm. Uh, and I, and I, I just fell in love with it. Being able to do that character, finding out you could play, you could play the villain, you know, for the rest of your life was immensely satisfying. <laughs> and you've been kind of chasing that, that feeling, uh, or trying to, to replicate it ever since. Yeah. I mean, I, it just kind of, it's what you become. It's, I have like the reputation, you know, mm -hmm. you see me walking through the room on my way backstage and people are like, Oh fuck, that's Anthony. Like it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's something that I take very seriously and I do, I wouldn't know how to do without it at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just fun to play the villain. And you, I look like a villain. Do you feel like you uh, intimidate uh, other comics, uh, younger comics, or, or any? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Intentionally. One hundred percent. I I don't. It's not an intention on my part, but I don't do anything to disarm them. You know, like I just mm -hmm. I'm happy that they're intimidated, uh, and I'm very polite and nice, but I. I'm not going to put them at ease either. Mm -hmm. Does that come out of a uh, a competition uh, kind of feeling? Like you don't want to uh, have to compete with some of these younger people coming up? I don't feel competitive with anyone, really. I mm -hmm. mean, you, there are people who are more successful than me, for sure, but they don't do what I do. And mm -hmm. popularity doesn't equal quality to me. I, I don't worry about it. You know, some of my favorite musicians aren't the people who win uh, Grammys every year, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I, or the my favorite movies aren't the ones that make the end of the year list. Um, that I don't, I don't worry about anyone. You know, in the beginning, maybe I would have uh, if someone came along and did dark one-liners better than me. But no one ever really did, and anyone who attempted it fell flat in the face. <laughs> that I, uh, that I appreciated. And do you feel like people are, are kind of staying off of that corner now because of you? Oh, 
I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's attractive to people to even try it. You know, I think mm. some of the older, some older comics look at me and they're like, oh, that looks like fun and they can't do it. Like you can't get darker as you get older because it makes you seem bitter. Right. But if you start out dark, you can always soften. And people will kind of people still remember what you did, and you're like kind of an old grandpa figure who you had definitely fought in a war and has done <laughs> some stuff, but now is is like an old sweet man. But you can't go the other way. Yeah, is that where you feel like you're uh, you're headed? Do you think you'll you'll soften as you get older? I hope so. You know, I would like to. Uh, you know, it's it's almost like be, being a, a punk rocker when you're younger. You know, but I'm 40 now. That I I want to evolve and change as a person and as an artist. That uh, I don't know how how I do it. You know, the writing lets me figure it out. But um, I, I've said this before, but I want to be the type of villain that other villains are afraid of. You know, we live in a world now where there, there are very real villains. I'm a comedian. When mm -hmm. people get mad at me, it's like I make people laugh for a living. There are way worse people out there you should be upset with. And I like that uh, I might make those people afraid. Mm -hmm. How did uh, how did Trump's election affect what you feel like you can talk about on stage? Because I know I, I read somewhere that you were developing a show before the election that ended up not happening because of the election. Is that or what, what, what is the story there? I was I was developing a show like a, like a sort of like the Jesselnik offensive, but more panel like an easier Jesselnik offensive. Mm -hmm. You know, not we no field pieces, no monologue, um, but talking about news of the day. And we were like, we're going to pitch this, but we're going to wait till the election is over so we don't have to talk about Trump. We were already mm. sick of it then. Yeah. You're like, let's just wait till then. Then we won't have to talk to him, talk about him anymore. Exactly. And if Hillary wins, then I can really be the villain. You know, mm. I can I can be like against her in, in a fun way. And then so we set up all these pitches for the week after the election. <laughs> and then those pitches were all so awful. Like everyone's just like, we don't want to hear about this now. We don't want to talk. Yeah. Like, and there were other shows that were being developed all over the place just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm neither equipped for this uh, nor am I interested in it. I don't like political humor. And you really couldn't take a different stance. You know, like that show, The Opposition with Jordan Kepe Ke Klepper? Klepper, yeah. Klepper. I was supposed to be very different. And then the Charleston uh, thing happened, and they were like, we can't even pretend we're on this side. Yeah, I uh, think it was really hard for him to, to do that, and then, yeah, that show didn't last. Yeah, yeah, it was, I mean, it was just, it, it, people just didn't want to see it, you know, and I'm glad there's people like Samantha B and John Oliver doing what they do, but we don't need that much of it, and I'm the last person who should be telling anyone how to vote or what to do, regardless. So I'm happy to tell you my opinion, mm -hmm. but I live a very different life than 99.9% than of the, the U.S. population. So I don't know why I'm telling anyone what to do. So in this alternate universe where Hillary won, what would that show have looked like? I think I would have basically been Trump. You know what I mean? I would have been like, I would have been, uh, I would have kind of been that sort of a parody, uh, kind of going against uh, PC. And I, to be quite honest, I'm glad, I'm not glad she didn't win, but I'm glad that I didn't have to do that show. You know, mm -hmm. I, I really like uh, Good Talk much more than I than I liked uh, the idea of talking about topical things. I just, that the Justin Nick Offensive was such a grind mm -hmm. and you had to do it weekly and you just hoped there was a good story. Mm -hmm. You know, you if Oscar Pistorius killed his girlfriend, you were like, oh, this is going to be a great week. <laughs> but if you didn't have that, it was a struggle and then you had to promote it like while it was happening. Whereas now I shot these things months ago and now I get to come in and do it. That's much, uh, much easier. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like the those the late night guys have a lack of stuff to talk about, though, with Trump. No, but it also there's something off putting to me about the joy they get out of it. You know, I'm sure they're I'm sure most of them are very liberal, uh, if not all of them. But they there's got to be some part of them that's happy when there's some crazy story that they get to talk about. And, you know, the fact that Stephen Colbert's ratings have gone up so much because of Trump. Don't tell me that you're not a little bit happy about this, you yeah. know, in a way that I just I, I find it unwatchable. Yeah. Um, it just it just, just hits me the wrong way. He did just do an interview uh, where he talked about that. He said he wouldn't have tr he had Trump on before the election, but he wouldn't have him on now, even though you can imagine the ra if Trump ever agreed to it, the ratings would be would be pretty insane for that. Yeah. But also, I mean, it's, it's like a ho it's like I would never have Trump on my show. You mm -hmm. know, it's a hollow thing to say. Like he's not <laughs> yeah. coming on yeah. my show. So <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy thing to say. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, you, you used to write for, um, for Jimmy Fallon back mm -hmm. in the day. Uh, what did you think when that whole thing went down with Fallon and Trump on his show and ruffling the hair and the, the sort of outrage that happened that he was, that Fallon was, was sort of too nice to Trump? I, I, th I you know, I felt, uh, I felt a little bad for Jimmy in that situation. Um, in, in a way that I, uh, 
You know, I I think that I think Lauren Michaels helped get Trump elected. You know, I think that uh, you know by putting him on SNL was way worse than the hair ruffling mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, and Jimmy's not a political guy. You know, he he's done th- political things, but he's not built for that. But Trump and 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 uh, Lauren Michaels are friends, and Lauren Michaels produced that show, so I'm sure there was part of it that was like, let's do something here. And I think it's I'm sure uh, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but and I haven't talked to Jimmy in in, in years, but I'm sure it's one of his biggest regrets is uh, is, is is ruffling his hair and doing that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was that weird time where even it was only a couple of months before the election, and even then, no one thought that it was possible that he could win. I mean. Mm-hmm. Is that, I mean, and it seems like that's how you felt too, because you were pitching that show based on the premise that he was going to lose. Yeah. I mean, it seemed insane that he would, that he could win. I just, I just didn't believe that, that Americans would vote for him. But then you look back and you're like, it wasn't that surprising. Yeah. You know, there's some people who, like, when you, you hear about polls where it's like only 40% of people say they approve of Trump, it's like 40 people say they do. Yeah. You and know, that's that, still that, a pretty high number. <laughs> yeah. And 20 people are like, I don't, but they go out and vote for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, Jimmy's not a political guy. And I, I think he took a lot of the a beating that he shouldn't have taken, that there were way more. Like, Trump didn't win the election because Jimmy ruffled his hair. Right. You know? It may not have been a great look for Jimmy, but it certainly it, it didn't it didn't turn anything. Mm-hmm. But you were you 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 saw when that SNL episode happened with him hosting you at the time. Did you feel like it was a, a mistake? I was dis- I mean I was disgusted by it. Mm-hmm. I was uh, frankly I I just uh, it's it's two rich guys helping each other out. You mm-hmm. know that I I don't know uh, I don't know how I would have dealt with it if I would if I had that job or I was on the show. But it was just mm-hmm. I, I found it to be quite frankly revolting. Yeah, you were almost going to be on that show. You auditioned for uh, to host Weekend Update, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you what do you remember about about that experience that uh, that audition? It was it was when they hired Michael Che. So it was kind of was it between the two of you basically? Or? No, it was um, it was uh, Cicely Strong. Mm-hmm. Had, had stepped down, and so it was. Uh, it was Colin Yost paired with like ten different people, oh, okay. and then me by myself. So it would have kind of oh, been really? going back to it. Then it wasn't going to be me and Yost together, or Jost, sorry. Uh, because uh, you don't know. Or... <laughs> I, n- no idea. I mean, I can guess. You know, yeah. that they don't want two uh, two white guys sitting mm-hmm. there next to each other. But I work better by myself. Yeah. You know, uh, you wouldn't have. Um, you wouldn't have wanted to do it uh, if you had to be paired with somebody or. If they said, I mean, I would have done, I would have, that was the one job I've ever wanted in my life. Right. Uh, and I've certainly moved past it now. And at mm. the, even at the time, I thought my chance to do it was over. I thought maybe I might have a window when Seth Meyers left. Mm-hmm. And then I had the Jesselnick offensive. And they mm-hmm. were like, your name was brought up and we thought about replacements, but you have a show with your name in the title that I was surprised to get the call. Mm-hmm. And I thought, you know, this is just, I'm not going to get this, but... Um, but it, it's fun to have the audition and I'm not going to mess it up. If I don't get this, it's not going to be my fault. Mm-hmm. And so I've really practiced, uh, I've, I, you know, I had some friends write jokes for me. I wrote some jokes myself. And then when you go in, like you're in a suit, you're on the set, you're sitting behind the desk and the camera comes down and you hear the announcer say, welcome to weekend update with Anthony Jeselnik. And I just started <laughs> laughing. I didn't expect that. And it's five people at a table, you know, in mm-hmm. the dark. Um, that it's it's set up like for you to not do well, and I killed it. Like I just I was just like this is this is I'm in my element. I had a great audition, and for weeks afterwards, I was waiting to hear, and they were like, "We think you might actually might get this," and then uh, and then I didn't. And you know, Lauren even called me himself uh, to say, oh, really? you know, you did a great job, but you know, we're going this direction, and I couldn't argue with him. You know, it's his show, um, and. Uh, Looking back at it now, I'm glad I didn't get it. You know, it, I, it, it took a lot of work to get to that point, but mm-hmm. uh, seeing what that show is, and I, you know, I, a friend, Michael Che is a friend of mine. He's doing a great job, um, but uh, but it's like John Mulaney was just like you would have hated it. You think you wanted that job, but Lauren telling you what jokes to tell and what not to mm-hmm. tell, and th- seeing that thing where Trump had to approve the jokes about his uh, rivals, I thought that was I would I don't know if I would have shown up for work that day. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know what would have happened. Yeah, so this was before Trump posted was when you when you auditioned. Mm-hmm. So you would have been there for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um I mean it's interesting when once someone's on SNL, it's kind of it's forever um you would forever be sort of like SNL's Anthony Jeselnik, you know? 
even if you're on there for like a season, it gets kind of tied to you in a way. It can. I mean, like Norm Macdonald, I think he escaped it. You know, there's yeah. certain people, and there's certain people who but got still weekend his, update. But still, what he's known for more than anything else, right? Mm -hmm. But Kevin Nealon hosted Weekend Update for like six years, and you don't think of him as a Weekend Update host. Like it's mm -hmm. strange how. Yeah. It's like doing a roast. Sometimes it's like the biggest thing in your career, and sometimes it's just something that you did, mm -hmm. and there's no rhyme or reason to it. So yeah. I don't know how I would have been accepted. Weekend Update would have been much different mm -hmm. if it was just me, as opposed to those two guys. You know, they have chemistry and they go back and forth mm -hmm. and and play with their relationship but uh but i haven't watched it in, in quite some time yeah what do you think your approach to to weekend update would have been what what when you think about it or when you were doing your audition how did you approach it i was just like let's just have killer jokes and you know instead of just being like kind of clever it was they were very dark mm -hmm. you know uh very dark harsh uh fun jokes that that i i was cracking between and smirking and and just uh, enjoying the hell out of myself, you know, that it would have been almost like me doing a roast once a week. Mm -hmm. But I think the re one of the reasons that show has changed and Weekend Update has changed is that it used to be just like Weekend Update at the end of the week. And now you have 10 shows all week long doing jokes about everything. Right. That it becomes tougher to be to be the best one. Mm -hmm. Was Norm MacDonald your, your favorite uh Weekend update. Anchor. Dennis Dennis Miller. Oh, really? Dennis Miller was my guy. I mean, yeah. He was the first one for me, and I just thought he was like the prototype. That uh, Norm, I, I loved when he was on it. Mm -hmm. When I go back and watch them, I, I it, Norm is tougher to watch than uh, mm -hmm. than uh, than Dennis Miller. Because Norm would go Norm would go pretty dark. Extremely dark and very simple and almost anti jokes, mm -hmm. which I'm not a huge fan of right, uh, for right. the most part. But uh, and he went, and went to the same well, you know, quite some, quite a few times. The, I think it's remembered the OJ better well. than <laughs> the OJ well, the, the the Frank Stallone well. Like mm -hmm. it was just, and a lot of those he's not doing that well. Like he's not doing that well. Like with the audience, mm -hmm. people at home were loving it, but yeah. uh, but it, but in the crowd, it was it was uh, it was it was an odd fit for Weekend Update. Coming up, Anthony explains why he's surprised by Louis C.K.'s attempt at a comeback. So you've been uh, you've been pretty open about your desire to be you know the best stand up comic uh, working. Um, did uh, do you feel like Louis C K S downfall uh, opened any doors for you in that uh, in that <laughs> regard? Um, I mean, I want to be the best I, because I think it's how I get the best out of myself. Like I just mm -hmm. on my deathbed, I want to be like I gave it my all mm -hmm. and being competitive and being like I want to be the best. It's like when rappers say they're the best of all time. Like every rapper says that. No mm -hmm. one's arguing. It's just like yeah. it's something people do to motivate themselves. Um, Louis C.K., uh, him getting kind of taken out, I think it opened doors for a lot of people mm -hmm. because he was just dominating the conversation yeah. uh, in a way that you, that you weren't talking about anyone else. It was like every comedy issue had Louis on the cover, or at least an article about mm -hmm. him and what a genius he was and what he was doing. And now it's just opened up, you know, there's, there's just a, a void there that anyone else can step into where you have to write about something. But in some cases, it's like GQ stopped doing their comedy issue. You know, like it's there are yeah. things that have changed because of it, but I don't know if it opened doors so much as just removed like the biggest obstacle. Like it, it took the elephant out of the room. Mm -hmm. What was that story? I saw something about you. You were uh, there was a headline that said that you accused him of stealing your jokes, but there was but that wasn't really the case. What's <laughs> no, the story there? Uh, it was uh, I was just telling a funny. I was d being interviewed by Colin Quinn. And we were talking about the seller and comics trying to guess my jokes. Mm -hmm. And there was a time, you know, t 10, 12 years ago, I was living in New York and I'm at the cellar and uh, I have a great set. I come off stage and Louis C.K. goes like, and this is a time where I didn't really know him that well. Uh, so it was like an honor for him to come talk to you. Mm -hmm. even. And he was like, Anthony, uh, I love your jokes because I try to guess what your punchline is going to be. And I come up with a joke that works but it's not what you came up with. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I try some of those on stage right now, like right after you? Mm -hmm. like he went on stage and was like, I love Anthony's jokes. I'm going to try my version yeah, of them. It was very much in context for the for the audience. Yes, and they loved it. Like they, they yeah. killed and it was just like fun. I thought it was great. And then I like, saw him, you know, six months later, eight months later at a show where it wasn't going. It was like a bad show. Mm -hmm. and I think he was just trying to fill time and did the jokes again. Mm -hmm. And I told it as like a funny with, story. With your punchlines or with his punchlines? With punch his punchlines. Okay. Um, and they didn't do well. You know, mm -hmm. and I and I really I and afterwards it kind of blew up. Like Colin and I laughed at the time, and then yeah. like later on they're like, "Oh, Anthony said he stole the jokes." Not at all. And I really don't believe that he ever told those jokes more than those two times that I saw him. I just mm -hmm. happened to see him the second time. Yeah. But if he told them even three times, I would have heard about it. 
Yeah. And if I found out that he was doing the setups like in his act or he did them in a special, it would have been a much different story. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would have we would have had it out over that. But that was certainly not the case. I just thought it was funny that he you know had to fall back to doing those. But I really don't believe he ever did it more than those two times. And, and borrowing a setup with permission is not the same as stealing material. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also saw somewhere that you uh, you said you you would want to roast him if that uh, if that ever came up. Is that is that still something that you that you want to do? I don't know. You know, I don't. Uh, at the time, it seemed maybe the one person who would be uh, who would be interesting to roast. But mm-hmm. now I, I don't. I'm not as interested in doing that. I'm not interested in part of being part of anyone's redemption tour. Right. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever do a roast again. It's kind of it's, yeah. It's kind of hard to imagine. Uh, you know, Comedy Central giving him that kind of platform. Uh, for a roast. Yeah, I mean, it would be years away, yeah. but I could see maybe, maybe it happening. It would depend on what his next special was like mm-hmm. and if he atones at all. I don't know. You know, people keep asking the question, like, should he be allowed to perform? And I think that's the wrong question. You know, this is show business. It's not fair, just, or even remotely reasonable. Uh, the question is, should you buy a ticket? Mm-hmm. And that's up to the audience member. Yeah, I think the there's the should you buy a ticket, but then there's also should he should you know a platform like a Netflix or or anywhere give him the platform, right? Yeah, but I mean they they give Aziz a platform. Like it's a, if it's a platform to come and apologize, mm-hmm. you know, then what's the problem? I yeah. mean, there are movies that are are insanely offensive, but you wouldn't try to censor them. That I don't know how stand up is any different. Um, and I don't, you know, like there were guests that I thought about on my TV show that they were like, no, like these people aren't aren't coming on. We're not going to have, we're not going to support this person, uh, and I, which I was fine with. But Louis can release it through his website, mm-hmm. you know, if he wants to. Um, but I'm not sure Netflix would completely be against uh, putting up his special. And I don't know if I would watch it, but I've read every single article about it. Like I, I'm just fascinated really? as someone. Like watch, it, like it's like watching someone fall down. It's just I don't feel bad for him at all. But I, I'm interested in people's takes on it and, and what happens. I just find it endlessly fascinating. So, I mean, what's what's your take on it? Do you, I mean, what's, yeah, I guess that's the question. What's, what's your take on it, the whole Louis thing? I don't really have one. You know, I'm not, I don't feel, I certainly don't feel bad for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think anything happened to him. Mm-hmm. I think that he did this. Uh, and if he can fight his way back, I'm interested in watching someone drag themselves through barbed wire. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, interesting to me. I'm, I'm shocked that he didn't wait a full year yeah, just so people could say to a, get back a, a on year after. And, yeah. So yeah. The, the fact that everyone's saying, you know, less than a year after these things, he came back, but, um, I don't feel bad for him, but I almost, I'm not rooting for him. I'm not rooting against him. Mm-hmm. I'm you know, sure like, you followed the whole, uh, you know, leaked set where he was joking about the parkland kids and joking about all this stuff that people that made people upset do you do you think that 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 he should be allowed to joke about whatever he wants to joke about or what what did you make of that whole thing i mean i just thought it i mean of course he's allowed to joke about whatever he wants Mm -hmm. like i would never be like oh you can't joke about parkland i would think he would have a better take on it Mm -hmm. you know but i also think that he was he was working towards something i don't think that it wasn't like that was a special yeah he's trying something and i'm a little surprised to be honest about where he's decided to go with this and the tact that he's taken mm-hmm. in his comeback. But who knows what the final uh, result is going to be. Um, but I, I mean, I read about this and I didn't listen to it. Mm-hmm. I wasn't interested, but I, I wanted to read, you know, opinions. And I think it's funny just to watch this guy who was like the comedy God for 10 years, uh, have to eat all this shit. Like, it's just funny <laughs> to me. Like, I, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, you, you feel, I feel bad that there are victims, but there are victims all over the world for all different things that uh, I don't think Louis is like the end all be all. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talked a little bit about your, your job working for Fallon. Um, what do you, what do you remember looking back on that now uh, writing for writing for that show when he started on uh, late night? I, I remember two things. I remember realizing very quickly that the romantic notions I had were foolish mm-hmm. that I'd heard about, you know, the start of Conan and guys like Louie and uh, Robert Smigel, you know, starting mm-hmm. the show and getting their ba- brains beaten every night uh, ratings wise. That's kind of how you canceled. thought it would be. I thought it would be more of like an experimental show. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't because by the time I got into late night, there was no late night. It was a 24 hour. It was like, let's, what clip can we get to go viral? So you really were doing a 24 hour show or a show that like kids could watch. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, 
and they couldn't really do, they didn't really want my sensibility. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't need it. Uh, Jimmy was doing so well right off the bat. Uh, the Roots was such a huge part of that show. And Jimmy didn't use the writers the way that even Seth Meyers does now, where they wouldn't have me on the show to come out and do a bit. You know, mm -hmm. it was like, why, why isn't Jimmy doing the comedy? Um, and then I just remember that it was just me and one other person for most of the run there writing monologue and just every day getting killed. Mm -hmm. Like people coming in and being like, we don't have enough jokes. Like Jimmy's rejected all of these. <laughs> and now, and I thought at the time I was like, I'm bad at this. What's going on? Yeah. But now that staff went from two people to like 15 people that I'm like, <laughs> now I'm like a little annoyed oh, that they yeah. didn't, that they made me feel bad when it's like, no, you're just understaffed completely. And I thought that I've, I left before a year that people would keep asking me about it, that I would be in interviews and they'd be like, why, why, why did this, you know, end so quickly? Mm -hmm. And once I left, I realized no one cares. I could have left <laughs> after 13 weeks and it would have been fine. But I love all the people that I started there with. It was a great mm -hmm. experience to, you know, start on a show months before it ever premieres mm -hmm. that, uh, that yeah. I still, I still love everyone from that, from that, that time. How did you get that? No, just kidding. <laughs> I was like, I can, I can tell you easily. My manager uh, used to work for Jimmy's manager, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they said, "Here's the packet. Do five sketch ideas, five desk piece mm -hmm. ideas, ten monologue jokes." I said, "Fuck you. Here's thirty monologue jokes <laughs> that I wrote today." Yeah. And they were like, "Oh, you're our first monologue writer. Like, go mm -hmm. ahead." And were were they were those jokes as? dark as as your other material or were you kind of trying to write to jimmy's sensibility i was trying to write clever more than dark mm -hmm. you know uh but there, i mean there were certainly there was certainly some darkness in there but mm -hmm. i only have one way to write mm -hmm. you know comedians when they write for for somebody they write what they would do and you hope the other person can do it comedy writers like the other people there all these harvard kids w would like try to figure out jimmy's voice and his sensibility i have no radar for that mm -hmm. it was just here's what i would do yeah, because I mean, ultimately, it wasn't probably the best fit. Your sensibility with Jimmy's not, uh, not at all. I mean, it was a, almost direct opposite. But in the beginning, we didn't know what w the show was going to be, what was going to happen. I think they were mm -hmm. like, if the critics come after us, do we want someone who knows how to take a head off with a joke? You know mm -hmm. that that uh, they realized very quickly they did not need me, but they yeah. liked me. Yeah. You know, when I finally quit, they were like, we never would have fired you. You know, mm -hmm. you would have been here as long as you wanted to be, mm -hmm. which surprised me. <laughs> um. So uh, the the Trump roast in in 2011 was your your first big uh, was a big breakthrough for you. Mm -hmm. I think looking back, uh, out of everyone on that roast, I think you and and Trump have uh, have succeeded the most after that uh, after that night. That's true. That's <laughs> have true. gone the farthest. Yeah, maybe Whitney Cummings. Yeah, yeah, she's um, in there because you were kind of the new guy on the scene in that um, in that roast. Um, so what do you what do you remember from from that first one? I mean, I remember it very well. I remember it because it was like the biggest night of my life and I knew it. I mean, I kind of got into stand-up in order to be on roasts. I mm -hmm. loved them more than I even loved stand-up comedy. And my jokes were very much like, look at me, I can do a roast if you need me to. And I'd written on the one before. Uh, they talked about putting me on that roast and like he's been giving away his best stuff mm -hmm. for, you know, two weeks now. Let's put him on the next one. And the next one was supposed to be Kid Rock. Mm. And I was like, "Ugh, Kid Rock!" And then they're like, "No, nope, it's going to be Trump." And I was like, "Oh yeah, this is going to be great." It's ironic. Because... They're, they're friends now. Oh yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I'm sure they were friends then. Uh, but uh, but I just knew that you, no one would ever feel bad for Trump, mm -hmm. no matter what you did. Yeah. Uh, that I just remember thinking, like, "Don't be nervous. Like, mm -hmm. that's the only way you can blow this." And I I really worked on the jokes. I was very pumped up, and I was worried that. I wouldn't be as good as the other roasters. And I went late in the show mm -hmm. and I see Lisa Lampanelli go up and Whitney coming. And they, I thought those were my main competition. You know, Jeff Ross does his thing, but he's not that mean. It's mm -hmm. more like, it's more clever. Yeah. So when, I, when I saw them go up, I realized, oh, I'm way meaner than these people. <laughs> I overcompensated yeah. and was so much uh, meaner than everyone else that mm -hmm. I just had the time of my life. And Donald, I'm not even sure if you're aware of this, but the only difference between you and Michael Douglas from the movie Wall Street, is that no one's gonna be sad when you get cancer. Did you feel a, a change in your career pretty quickly after that? Immediately, it was like night and day. Yeah. Because I was on the road as a headliner, uh, and I had had an album out, but it was like most people coming to see comedy, and mm -hmm. they'd be like, why is this guy being deadpan and talking about babies all the time? Whereas after the roast, it was sold out shows and everyone knew exactly what they were getting. So I was, uh, I was very happy. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how people roasted you that, um, that first one, uh, maybe compared to how you think they might roast, people might roast you now? 
You know, I don't know if there's even that much of an angle on me now that wasn't there before. I mean, in the beginning, it's just like, who is this guy? Mm, it's a lot of you that. You know, you're yeah. you're a nobody. Who'd you blow to get on stage? Mm. Like, it's like that. It's the, the thing they do to the new guy every time. Yeah. And by the time I'd done the Roseanne roast, it was like Anthony Jessel, like, is a rapist. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how I became, like, that's the angle on me is, is a rapist that I assume that would probably be still the angle. You know, yeah. I still hear, like, you talk slow. And mm -hmm. that's from the roast. You know, mm -hmm. it's people that that was just like the angle that they could find because you're no one cares about you. Mm -hmm. You know, they want they want to talk about these C list celebrities and not the uh, not the comedians. Yeah. So you did the the Charlie Sheen roast and then the Roseanne roast, and that was kind of your your roast uh, trilogy. That was it. You know, like Whitney Cummings did three, and I always thought like I would do three. I saw mm -hmm. Geraldo uh, didn't enjoy the roast toward the end. Felt mm -hmm. like he had to do them. Like it was mm -hmm. like a weight around his neck that I never wanted to be that. Mm -hmm. And on the Franco roast, which I would have done. But they didn't want me. Mm -hmm. They were like, we're classing up the roast a little bit. We're going to have, like at one point, they were like, we're going to have Natalie Portman and Kate Hudson on the dais. <laughs> and they're like, we're not bringing Anthony up to talk to, like make fun of them. Yeah. And I was like, I get it. I'm not going to argue. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm not invited to the party, I'm not, I don't want to go to the party. Uh, and then, of course, all those people dropped out and they ended up doing a normal roast like they would have. Yeah. But I just haven't felt the need to go back since. I feel like I just did it so well the three times that I did it that I don't uh, I don't know if I could ever top it. And I, I mean, I love doing roast battle. Yeah. I don't know if that'll ever come back, but that's fun because you're just sitting there mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, thinking off the top of your head and riffing with uh, watching people do it to each other. Yeah. I mean, you've been a judge on that show. So, what? yeah, what's that, what's that experience like? It's amazing. I mean, you just show up, you sit down, and you have a little piece of paper in front of you with everyone's – I don't know. I I know maybe half the contestants, mm -hmm. but not even that well. Yeah, they're and all kind of up-and-coming – comedians uh lesser known comedians yeah and a couple sometimes it's a friend you know you'll get a todd berry or someone mm -hmm. in there but i just sit there watch them and i'm just trying to think of a joke and i usually just vote for the person i have the better joke for you know mm -hmm. it's not uh it's not rocket science and it's it's very fun um you mentioned this too but uh last comic standing uh what do you what do you remember from from that experience and i know you got to hang out with norm mcdonald on that it was uh, just a goddamn nightmare i mean it was, it was <laughs> i just did not realize what i was getting into yeah and i uh it was just tapings were so long they took forever the, i didn't respect 99% of the comics that I was listening to i didn't know most of them mm -hmm. and uh i thought that if i'm the host they're going to make the show about me. Like I'm going to be a different kind of host and make fun of the judges, make fun of the contestants. And they cut every bit of it. Like <laughs> they, there are a couple of moments of me and Norm going back and forth, but for the most part, they took it, it took out everything. They're like, don't worry, Anthony, we took out everything that made you look like an asshole. And I was like, I very much wanted this to be me. Like <laughs> the host like, is an asshole. That's my thing. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole reason I did this. Um, just not realizing, yeah, it's a competition. They have to show the other comics. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norm and I didn't get along comedically at first. Mm -hmm. uh, just I don't think he knew, we didn't really know how to handle each other. Uh, and a lot of that was my fault, uh, you know, as a, as a host. I think everyone was surprised at the way that I, yeah. uh, the aggressive way that I hosted. Uh, but by the end of it, we were uh, we were great and we figured it out. Mm -hmm. uh, so we end every episode by asking the guests, "What's the last thing that made you laugh really hard?" Um, I don't know if you're a if you're a laugher or not at other people's uh, stuff, but what, is there something that that you've seen recently or someone on stage that, that made you laugh? There's not a bit. I mean, it's hard. To, it's really hard to make me laugh when you're on stage. You know, mm -hmm. I can like I can chuckle at some things. I think, oh, that's funny, but it's hard to make me laugh. The thing, the first thing I thought of when you said that, there's a website I look at every day that I that I love called Clickhole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, it's like a sister site of The Onion. That's almost like a BuzzFeed type thing. Yeah. And I forget. I don't know what the what the last one I saw that really made me laugh. But there was one that was. Uh, it was like, uh-oh, like not so great news for television. The scene in Chernobyl where they shoot all the dogs got the highest ratings in television history. <laughs> and I just, the, the, it made me laugh so hard that, uh, that I, I think I was just sitting there for hours like with my computer just cracking up every time I would look at it. I love yeah. Clickle. Yeah, it's kind of like one-liners, headlines. A little bit. And they have like, you know, they get to use a picture. Like if I tweeted, you know, bad news, if I tweeted that headline, mm -hmm. no one would. It wouldn't be as funny. It, it wouldn't yeah. be funny at all. Yeah. But in that context, the way they do it, it just it just knocks it mm -hmm. out of the park. But I, I, I love that website. All right. Well, whoever out there wrote that headline, you, you know. It's I've met favorite. people who work at ClickHole and they're like, thank you. Because I'll retweet it a mm -hmm. lot or be like, I yeah. love ClickHole. And they're like, thank we love it when you do that. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's great. All right. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you so much to Anthony Jeselnik for being on the show today. 
His new show, Good Talk, premieres on Comedy Central this Friday night, September 6th at 11 p.m. And you can stream Fire in the Maternity Ward on Netflix right now. Also, subscribe to Anthony's podcast, The Jesselnick and Rosenthal Vanity Project, which is back with a new season this week as well. If you enjoy this show, please tell your friends and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Matt Wilstein and at thedailybeast.com. The Last Laugh is distributed by Himalaya Media for The Daily Beast. It is produced by Jason Smith and Scott Porch for Starburns Audio and edited by Mackenzie Mazell. Our theme music is by Claude, who you can find on Instagram at claude.mp3. You can also find the show every week on Apple Podcasts, the Himalaya app, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can find show notes and highlights from each episode on thedailybeast.com. See you next week.